Howdy, folks, and welcome to episode 461 of the Dev Robot Society. I'm Paul E. Cooley, your scuba instructor, and joining me today is Terry, the riverboat captain, Mixon. How you doing, Terry? We're coming to you live from our, our the Dev Robot Society submarine here in Houston, Texas. <laughs> I am so totally changing my caption to being riverboat captain. <laughs> It was what island island tour, yeah. Island tour guide, yeah. There we go. So so mine is uh, underwater explorer. <laughs> oh my god! So at least we're both high and dry. Um, so far, um, they're rather dry. I don't know about the high part, but uh, we're both both dry, and our houses are not underwater yet. Um, hopefully that's that's not going to be an issue. So we're recording this, what is it, Monday, August 28th? It is. We're doing a day early because there's going to be a tropical storm rolling over us probably tomorrow. We to figured along with our flooding. We figured y'all would want your content. And since Terry and I had both have power and internet and nothing better to do. <laughs> I, for one, am trapped in the neighborhood. Although the house is high and dry, all the exit roads are flooded. So I'm going nowhere. I seem to have some time on my hands. <laughs> Yes, but did you, you get your you writing would done? figure that I would use it for writing, but I have to keep running down and staring at Jim Cantori <laughs> on the Weather Channel. I'm having like a bro crush on him or something. That guy, that guy is all over the place, and he always looks like he's about ready to come unglued. It reminds me when, uh, 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 oh God, who was the famous uh, Houston weather for? Was it Neil Frank? Yeah, Neil Frank during Allison, they were like, uh, you know, two in the morning or whatever. Neil will give us some good news. There is no good news. <laughs> he just completely lost his shit. Have you lost your fucking mind? Yeah, that's Neil Frank. <laughs> that is indeed Neil Frank. Yeah, I, I just about cried when he uh, when he retired because he was so good at his job. But yeah, that that night he just lost his shit. It's there like, was one guy that that was down here that that did his weather reporting standing in a ditch. I'm trying to remember his name. It'll it'll come to me at the last moment, I'm sure. Everyone mocked him. Yes. Everyone everyone should have mocked him. But uh yeah, Dr. Neil Frank was was awesome. We miss you. Um so uh how's the writing? <laughs> I actually have gotten some writing done. Um I am taking a break from writing Battle for Terra and I'm knocking out a short story for an anthology. And I'm about halfway done with it. And it's it's fun, but gosh, it's hard to focus on doing it when all you want to do is stare at the weather and see what's going on. <laughs> it's um, it's a disease, man. It's a disease. Cause you're always you're always checking out. Well, I don't know about you, but my phone has had like uh, uh 45 weather alerts just in the past two days. I turned those off. I had to turn them. Well, we turned them off a long time ago anyway, but uh, I think I posted something on there. We had 15 warnings. Mm -hmm. at one point so it, it it's kind of hard to ignore it it really is difficult to ignore it i'll get back to my writing assuming that the power stays on tomorrow um, we'll see how that works out but luckily my schedule has some built-in slip to it it's not harming my overall schedule to to go ahead and take some time to to watch the the disaster unfold around us and this is a natural disaster oh yeah oh definitely Definitely. But this is back, to, back to Jim Cantore. He's the kind of guy I saw on a special before this. He went to a wind tunnel to demonstrate what hurricane force winds were like. So they strapped him into a, a, a <laughs> harness and stuck him into the wind tunnel and cranked it up bit by bit to 190 miles an hour for the oh wind. Oh my God. Holy oh. cow. Did his cheeks go like... They went that way long before he got to 190. At 190, he had waves in his skin where it was like, like rippling. rippling his entire head, his bald head, all the way back. It was impressive. That that was a cat a cat five. That's cat yeah, five winds, that's, right? That's category five hurricane winds. He originally said, "Yeah, this 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 wind tunnel goes up to 190 miles an hour, but we're not going to go that high." And they cranked him up to 190 miles an hour, and he could not say no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because by that time he couldn't speak. <laughs> exactly. So he, knowing him though, he probably went for it. Eh, probably, probably. In for a penny, in for a pound. Crank that sucker up. <laughs> 
So let, let's uh, let's talk. The, the, this is interesting because today's intro is actually for an, uh, an interview with, with you two regarding this book. But you and Glenn Stewart just released a new book. Yes, Heart of Vengeance. It's doing exceptionally well, perhaps not as well as his bestsellers, but far better than my usual bestsellers. It's it's nice having some coattails to ride along with. <laughs> So uh, here's here's the the vaunted question. I think I asked this during the episode, um, the upcoming episode. Anyway, uh, have you seen a spike in your back catalog yet? I'm seeing a spike in people signing up for my mailing list, and I'm seeing a rise in sales. I don't think that I'd call it a spike, but I'm seeing an upswell. If that makes any sense, that's even better. That's so, even better. I think that it's going to work out just fine. I'm I'm definitely attracting some folks from his side of the aisle as well. And I'm pretty happy with that. He sent a, a note out that it peaked. The last time he looked, it was at like 206 was what it was at last night sometime. Mm -hmm. So it, it almost broke into the top 200 and it's sitting at 218 right now. So I absolutely cannot complain about having a book at 218. That is awesome. Congrats, man. Congrats Thank to you. both of you. I thought that is hella cool. I'm so usually, happy. Usually my books open into the, the the ones that release well will be into the five, six hundred range at the initial spike. And when they go through that initial drop off and then come back up, when people start doing the also bots, it'll it'll rise back into the seven, eight hundreds, maybe a little lower, maybe a little higher. So this is significantly better than I normally see on my own, although I do damn well. And I'm, I'm not trying to, to downplay that, but it's nice seeing how the other side lives. <laughs> <laughs> you're, get, you're getting a taste of what it is to be a real boy. <laughs> I will totally be, be Glenn Stewart's cabana boy. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, well let's hope that uh, very soon your sales match that anyway on your own works me i've got a long way to go i got an orange banner that says that i'm a bestseller i've never had one of those before i've had three of them <laughs> yeah they don't come out so easily in the military science fiction subcategories no but I, I did get that in derelict i did get that for marines i got one of those for marines and i got one for tomb too if i remember correctly i know i got one for the black but uh, I got one for Marines as well. So, yeah, it's it's not just getting the banner, though. It's how long does it stay there? And it sounds to me like y'all are going to be there for a while. So that's pretty damn cool. Fingers that's crossed. Cool. Yeah. My bank account could certainly use the assistance. Yeah, I understand that completely. I got kind of derailed on a lot of things because of uh, health issues and uh, pretty massive jolt of depression. But uh, I've kind of come out of it and, and uh, working on uh, getting flames done again, which is now at 111,000 words. You're unstoppable. And, and, and moving upward. <laughs> <laughs> so I still have another three or four scenes to write and a couple of things to go back to. So I, I think in this may be a 115 or um, before it's over with. You've got plenty fine. of space to go to get to that Dan Sanderson level. Dan Sanderson? Brandon Sanderson. Brandon Sanderson, excuse me. I was thinking God. Dan Wells for some reason. I'm not sure. I got my I got him all morphed together in my head. Dan, Dan, Brandon Sanderson. Dan Wells is definitely not Brandon Sanderson. Yeah, pretty and much. Vice versa. Yeah. Dan Wells actually writes a story as opposed to a universe. Um wow, I'm getting so bitchy about that. I really need to stop. 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 Anyway, um, so while while this was going on, I I had this really strange thought about the uh, the fourth black book, and uh, I was talking to B Man the other night about it after we after we saw the uh, Dark Tower uh, film, and I need to put my my review on that too. But um, I'll get to that tomorrow. The 
The idea would make the series a bit longer than I had planned and would also complicate the ever loving shit out of it. Um, you say that like it's a bad thing. No, it, it's not. It's not that it's a bad thing. It's just making me rethink how I want to do this. And it also means that it would take a lot longer to get the books done. A lot longer. But you're going to have more product when you're done. But I'm going to have more product. But I'm thinking these are, um, you know, this 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 means evolution will probably be at least 120, 120,000 words at least. Or is it going to be two books? Or it could be two books because I have this penchant for pissing off people and I might as well just continue that. So the... Uh, it's um, called tradition at this point. Yeah. <laughs> it's what you expect from false sci-fi shit. Uh, so I... I just, I, I had this crazy idea and I don't know if it'll fly. I don't know if it's jumping the shark. We'll talk about it offline. All right. Get, well, get your, we start. don't have to go into the details of it now, yeah. but yeah. saying you don't know whether it'll fly or not, all I have to do is say the words Sharknado and you know that anything can fly, which of course, you know, brings up what we were talking about <laughs> just before the show where you're going to go ahead and start writing Jelly Gator NATO. Jelly Gator NATO. <laughs> Yeah, I, I guess it was, was it last night? I think it was last night I put up the uh, uh, the ridiculous plot idea that I had. Um, and uh, somebody was like, all I know for sure is that you are high. <laughs> <laughs> so I thought, oh, well, that means it was a good idea. I, you know, you loved once, it, didn't you? Once you're done covering the flood and, and writing Jelly Gator NATO, you could go ahead and write the sequel, which is Jelly Gator NATO 2, Feel the Burn. Feel the bird. Oh my God, this is so bad. Just stop it. <laughs> On that note, we're going to get out of this so so we can introduce you all to Glenn Stewart and uh, uh, this Terry Mixon guy and talk about this book they wrote. If you have not gone out and picked up your copy of Heart of Vengeance, you should do so because it's on sale for $2.99 right now. <laughs> and sometime in the next day or so, which would be when you're getting this podcast if you haven't gotten it it's going to go up a little bit so go grab your copy while you can and we will put uh links in the show notes to that so go up to the website or check the uh, uh check the show notes on the on the actual podcast episode or if you're watching the youtube it should be in the description below now let's get to this interview whoop, whoop. Today we have author Glenn Stewart who's going to talk to us about his works and why the hell he picked this Terry Mixon doofus to help him write the next that the, the the newest one, latest one, whatever. So Glenn, welcome to the show. Thank you. Now, for our listening audience that doesn't know who the hell you are, who are you? Who am I? I'm nobody. I'm not important. No, really, so everyone has just my publisher tells me. That's, that's Somehow scary. I don't think that's true. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm the author of now four ongoing series without Terry and one with Terry. Uh, Starship's Mage, Castle Federation, Duchy of Terra, Onset, and now Vigilante with Terry, which gives me five ongoing series, and I believe Heart of Vengeance makes 18 novels out. Wow. I, yeah. There are a couple of standalone fantasy out there, but I have never been successful in fantasy. <laughs> discounting C series a space fantasy it, series How does that star work? wars why not that's a good chunk of the logic behind starship smash yes okay explain this to me what what exactly is a science fiction fantasy so in this in the starship smash setting all of the science all of the tech is as hard as i can make it I have a better than layman's, but not fully to being an engineer or a scientist understanding of physics, especially around space travel. And everything in of the science in Starship's Mage is pretty much bang on hard SF. And then there's mages. Uh, huh? Yeah, basically. Ooh. So in the setting, there was a massive eugenics project carried out by a bunch of really evil bastards who bred the magic gift back into the human race intentionally and among the other things that the mages do they can jump they can with certain tools teleport a starship a full light year okay so they're kind of so like instead navigators of having, in dune uh navigators in dune and mccaffrey's talent series i think was also one that used something similar it's it's 
it's been done, similar things have been done a few times under the psionics label. At, in Starship's Mage, it's explicitly very much a magic that, that's going on. And it's got rules, and I understand how it works, though not necessarily the characters in the setting, so it's not explained to the reader. But I know what the limitations of it are, which is important. I find when you're working with magic. So the setting is basically we don't we have no scientific solution to FTL travel. We have no scientific solution to instant, to FTL communications. All of this is magic. Literally. A wizard did it. <laughs> I have to say that I chanced across your name and your your book the first time going through a space opera official marketing thread. And the entire concept of mixing the two is what attracted me to trying you out mm -hmm. for the first time. And I love that series. It's awesome. I'm working on the first of the Starship's Mage Universe books as opposed to the Starship's Mage books right now. So that'll be an interest that's an interesting project to dig through. What's the difference between the two? It's not a Damian Montgomery novel. Ooh. All right. It's a David Rice novel. And what 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 is a a the, what are those two characters? Damian Montgomery is the main character of the Starship's Mage five book series. He's an extremely powerful mage, uh, a hand of the Mage King of Mars. His job is to basically be a troubleshooter for the Mage King. Emphasis on trouble and emphasis on shoot. <laughs> Usually, he finds trouble and gets shot by it. But <laughs> so he's a fixer. David, yes. David Rice, on the other hand, is the captain of the ship that Damian Montgomery served on before he became a hand of the Mage King. Ah, uh, okay. So the first book is Damian becoming the becoming a powerful enough mage to be the the hand of the Mage King of Mars, and in that book, he's simply simply the jump mage aboard David Rice's freighter. Okay. And when all of that comes down and it's over, Damian Montgomery gets drafted by the Mage King, and David Rice no longer has a ship. <laughs> Awkward. The Interstellar oh, Mage begins when David Rice gets the replacement ship that the Mage King gives him in, basically in trade for Damian Montgomery. I can imagine what kind of trade that might, that might equate to, so that should be interesting to see. <laughs> <laughs> they stopped building these ships. They were too expensive and really big targets. Why did they give me one? Oh, God. Well, it can't all, you know, be good. It's got to have some downside to it. <laughs> <laughs> Operating costs. <laughs> Operating costs. That's, that's usually the downfall of, of any any system like that. But but you yeah, have maybe. magic. You can just create matter from nothing, right? Nope. Closest that they come to that is flipping polarity. They have the ability to flip polarity to turn matter to antimatter, which helps fuel their antimatter engines. But otherwise, there's no creating anything from nothing. Terry, I thought there was a ban on antimatter in science fiction. I thought that was, that was a, a totally different universe. Oh, totally, totally different. different universe. Okay, all right, all right. Just checking. That's the Four Horsemen universe where I wrote a short story <laughs> where they banned antimatter, but I had to write about it anyway. <laughs> because Terry's a smart ass. Give me a limitation, and I'll explain why it's a limitation. I can yeah. write a cautionary tale as well as anybody else. <laughs> <laughs> So five series, how are you, how do you juggle five series? This is this is a thing, you know, we we talked a little bit about with, with Terry before because he's juggling mm -hmm. a whole bunch of crap as well. Uh, I cycle. So it's basically a book in each series and then back. And of course Terry writes Vigilante. <laughs> Everything I had to do for Vigilante was done years ago. So Terry's just fixing my mess for me. Ah, I see. How I, I look works. forward to seeing how well these two books do in the end because if if it does well enough and I can sweet talk you into writing more in this series, then we'll see how the, how the balance actually shifts around. That'll be interesting to see. Yeah. Cause basically right now we have three co-authors on this series. There's mm. 33 year old Glenn, 19 year old Glenn and Terry. Oh, <laughs> I, I, I have to say that going through this the first time was a learning experience because I wasn't sure when I started exactly how much I should change the basic set of the story. And it was only mm -hmm. when I got nearer to wrapping it up where I realized just how much freedom you were giving me to change it. Otherwise, I think I might have yeah. might have changed the beginning a little bit more than I had, but I was being cautious. Yeah. So then I went back and rewrote the beginning. So it all worked out. <laughs> it came out really well in the end. I, I think people are going to like it. It did. I'm really pleased with it. 
So when you're juggling five different series, how what, what's your release cycle like? I mean, you're obviously flipping back and forth, but uh, how, how many books are you putting out of here at this point? Uh, if everything breaks the way we currently expected, including both Vigilante books, I will have nine books out in 2017. Dude, wow. that's awesome. Wow. Of which I will have written seven and Terry will have written two. I will probably actually write, my target is about seven and a half. My target is a book every six days, seven weeks. Hmm. And how 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 long are your books? In general? Dep one, depending on series, between eighty and one hundred twenty thousand. Okay. All right. So, so the gonna... onset books are about eighty thousand. Vigilante is about eighty thousand. Uh, Duchy of Terror runs at about one hundred twenty thousand, and then Castle Federation and Starship's Mage both run about ninety to one hundred thousand words apiece. Okay. I want to remind our listeners: we did review one of your books. Um, was yeah, it? Yeah, Terran uh, Privateer. Terran Privateer, Duchy of, Terror, Duchy of Terror, book one. Yes, we did review yep. that. God, when was that, Terry? Eight months ago? Feels like something like that, yeah. It was before I moved, so I don't know. It was more than eight weeks ago, and time before I moved is, complete, is a complete amorphous mess. <laughs> <laughs> You've Have got... you started unpacking yet? It's all unpacked. It's just not necessarily organized. I'm sitting in what will eventually be my wife's oil painting studio, which currently has uh, two folding tables and a bookshelf. <laughs> yep, sounds like you just moved. <laughs> As Paul knows for a fact that when you move, things never get unpacked. There will still be boxes years later. There is at least one box floating around here that was not packed in the move to come to this house and was not packed in the move to come to Ontario, and was not packed in the move to the last house we moved to in Alberta. It was packed in the move before that. <laughs> it's, it's like a time capsule. You're going to open it and, and it go, has just what moved. Has like the only thing that happened was we had to open it and take out the candles when we were moving to Ontario because the shipping company didn't want to be transporting candles in a truck in the summer for two for three days. All right, that makes sense, I guess. Well, it's Canadian summer. How hot could it possibly get? In Alberta, not very. Here, 33, 34 Celsius. What the hell is That's that in actual hot. degrees? I have no idea what it is in Fahrenheit. <laughs> I'm sorry. I Multiply by two and minus 20 or something like that. Is something that? like that. Something like that. I can't remember. I was actually trying to figure that out when I was in Germany uh, not too long ago. I was like, I can't remember what the calculation is for that. <laughs> I had to go look it up. Why does the US have to just one. be backwards? God. <laughs> I remember trying to do it the other way around when I was in Vegas and I gave up. I just went, eh, it's hot. It's Vegas. <laughs> Oh, here's a question for you. Are all your measurements in meters or do you you do you use English system? Uh, me personally or in my fiction? In your fiction. I try to stick to full metric. Okay. I have been called out on for, by my copy editor the fact that I tend to actually fall back on what I do in reality, which is some distances are in imperial and some distances are in metric. So in, in, if I'm actually measuring distances myself, short distances are in centimeters, medium distances are in feet, longer distances are in meters, and then kilometers. Oh, my God. No, no. Get the feet out of there. Welcome to Canada. <laughs> get those feet out. Well, Canada is the same. Grams, pounds, kilograms. <laughs> I lived in Canada right when they were making the switch over to metric. So it was, it was uh, yeah, really interesting. I'll make you feel old. That was before I was born. That does not surprise me. That does not surprise me at all. What was I, six? 70, 75, 76, somewhere in there. And all the teachers were yeah, radically so confused. 33 Celsius is 91 degrees Fahrenheit. Yeah. That's how hot it is today. So it gets up to, <laughs> yeah. It's a bit colder today because it's raining, but it's hotter here than it is in Alberta during the summer, and it stays warmer longer. So that's part of why I moved. Yeah. Hmm. That's upsetting. I miss the cold. I miss the cold a lot. But well, when when you get to a hundred to experience one hundred four and one hundred six uh, um, heat indexes on a regular, fairly basis. Uh, yeah, that's when you go hide in a pool. Yeah, that would require you to have one, and that would require for it not to boil. But that's a completely different uh, conversation <laughs> altogether. 
So with science fiction versus fantasy, which one do you, you've done both. You, you said you're more successful in the science fiction arena. Which one do you been, like writing better? I have been focusing on space opera for so long. It's hard to say. <laughs> like I pulled out, I do enjoy both to a large extent. I think I do come down on the science fiction side being more fun for me a lot of the time. Um, I write an urban fantasy series now just to kind of keep my hand in. And God knows I have, I occasionally get ambushed by three novel outlines for fantasy series, but I, I can't economically justify them. So, yeah, I think I understand that, uh, that problem completely, but better than most probably. Yeah. Yeah. My fantasy series don't do where the shit either. So I completely understand. Yeah. I haven't that, touched that other than, yeah, other than urban, I haven't touched fantasy in two years. So. I keep wanting to write an urban fantasy story, but I've already got so many balls in the air that I can't justify starting yet another series because I don't want to do that and then not visit it again for a while. Yeah, I found with urban fantasy, actually, the gap between my book two and my book three of six months, which is perfectly fine in space opera, I lost half the audience that was following the series. Mm. Like The third book did not do well at all, unfortunately. Is that one of the reasons why you decided to mix uh, science fiction and fantasy in the mage, the science fiction mage books? Whose, whose name I've already forgotten. Starships series, my apologies. Starships Mage, yes. Thank you. Um, that was... I don't even remember why that originally got written, to be honest. It started as a short story that I wrote to... Literally, it, wasn't even, it was never intended to be published. I wrote the short story as, an, as a self-entertainment thing. And then my agent asked at the time asked me if I could turn it into something more, and I went eh. And then my wife talked me into doing it as a novella sequence and self-publishing it. Mm. So that worked out apparently. So, do you still have an agent? Do you still work with publishing companies, or are you just? Now I still have an agent. He doesn't have very many of my books anymore, but I still technically have an agent. Uh, there is still one or two books I don't actually remember. I'd literally have to email him to find out that are out with traditional publishing houses that we're waiting to hear back on. Um, the one I can actually remember has been with the same house for a year. And the only reason it didn't get published last year was because they specifically asked for this manuscript a year ago. Hmm. We've heard crickets since, so. <laughs> yeah, that sounds like, again, never mind. I'll, I'll, yep. I'll shut up. I'll shut up. <laughs> <laughs> everybody knows the argument and the bitch there on the part of every author who submitted to traditional publishing ever. Yeah, I don't have that particular problem with my with my publisher, so but but I know everybody who has the problems with their publishers. So based on what I'm seeing here, you you you've done a lot more of your work is out as an independent. I have done all of my work as an independent. So none of your work has ever been published by a publishing company? Uh, they've been public. The audiobooks are done by Tantor and Podium. Okay. So I am tr technically traditionally published in audio, but I am entirely independently published in text and in ebooks and physical copies for the actual textbooks. Okay. What's been your? Ex well, obviously your experience has been awesome, but were there any? <laughs> uh, were there any particular uh, problems that you've you've faced or or during the evolution of of the uh, independent platforms? So far, so good. Um, I have concern. I, I did. I tried to stay out of Kindle Unlimited for quite some time, which ended up not working out very well for me. I didn't actually. It was when I went in, fall in with Kindle Unlimited that I started making enough money that I could do this full time. So much as I do not like feeding the eight hundred pound gorilla's monopoly, I play along with the eight hundred pound gorilla's monopoly because it feeds my cats. <laughs> Yeah, there's a reason why we're not sponsored by Audible or Amazon because we bite the hand that feeds constantly. I think it's more <laughs> like because they don't know we exist, but that's okay. Well, I haven't. Everybody asked me when we're going to actually get some, you know, sponsorship on this show so we can we can make some more cash. And uh, no, I I couldn't be that kind of hypocrite. It's bad enough I have to use their platforms. I'm certainly not going to take money directly from them so I can bitch about them. It just seems <laughs> stupid. So don't want to do it. That would seem kind of ironic, actually. <sighs> no, 
bitch about Amazon and then go, oh yeah, and at Amazon, Amazon can do this for you, and now they have house cleaning and this that and leave. No, we are not sponsored by Amazon. I'm not doing that shit. It's not fucking happening. No, bad Terry, bad, bad Terry. <laughs> I get that look so often from him. I'm an instigator. I cause trouble. Uh huh. Yeah, I've I know. Noticed. Usually for me, has he caused you trouble? When so you two just collaborated on this book. Yeah. And he uh, did the good stuff. I did the bad stuff. He. No, uh, we're blaming the bad stuff on 19 year old me because he's not here to defend himself. <laughs> <laughs> you know that that is just such a freaking cop out. My <laughs> God, that's horrible. <laughs> I stole it from Terry Pratchett. <laughs> <laughs> well, at least you didn't say Terry Mixon. Don't steal anything from Don't that. Don't steal anything from me. <laughs> <laughs> so this Terry is Pratchett said with the release of the Carpet People that I read that it had two authors, eighteen year old him and forty year old him, and they didn't get along very well. Been there, done that. Um, yeah, finally kicked eighteen year old or twenty year old Paul to the curb and said no. Uh, let's redo this entire thing. So is that more or less what you did here? This is, this is, we're talking about heart of vengeance, the book, one of the yeah. vigilante series, which you and Terry just co-wrote. Yeah. So is that more or less what happened? So you started with, restart? not entirely. I think there's of the 80,000 or so words that's in heart of vengeance, about 25,000 are pre the rewrite that I sent Terry. So, Actually, um, chapters 1 through 14 out of 30 were your original material. So almost half the book. Yes, except I rewrote that before I sent it to you. So <laughs> and then, you, then, actually then I rewrote it, then you rewrote it again. again. <laughs> so so how, how did this exactly work, guys? I mean, first off, how did you two end up uh, deciding to do this he, together he sent me an instant message and i almost drove off the road on the way back from the gym that's what you get for looking at your messages while you're driving you doofus i know Should do that yeah yeah i've been debating i had the original vigilante novel which is about 100 100 110 000 word novel with a severe structural defect in the middle and it was unpublishable it the pieces of it were decent but the total of it was unpublishable so I, I had been meaning for several years to rewrite it into two books and I just, I was not getting around to it. And I finally accepted that I wasn't going to get around to it. And then it was a matter of, okay, so if I'm going to grab a co-author, who am I going to grab? And it came down to, there were a couple of different names on my list. I asked Terry first and Terry sort of jumped up and down going, me, 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 me. He's so needy, isn't he? He's just I so know. needy. And I'm so, I'm, I'm such a prima donna. It's, I'm terrible. <laughs> Yes, Terry, the prima donna Mixon. We just call him prima donna. We just call him the PD on this show. <laughs> TPD. As TPD, you know, as Terry, prima donna. Now, Terry, why were you excited to get on, on this gig? Why, why would you want to do this? Because I absolutely love Starship's Mage, and the chance of working with a guy that can create some amazing stuff like that was something that I wanted to get on. I really did want to to be part of that just because he's awesome if you haven't read starships mage you need to because it's an amazing series wow there's a lot of ass kissing going on here i'm not sure i noticed i'm not <laughs> sure i'm happy with where this this conversation is going i mean if you it's not ass kissing if it's true if it there is was, easily one of my favorite series if there was not lots of squabbling you know terse messages going <laughs> back and forth, passive aggressive tendencies of reward choice and plot points, then this conversation has no point. You know, if this, if this co-writing expedition was a novel, it would be thrown out because of lack of drama. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a Nathan Lowell novel is what you're telling me. Oh, <laughs> Damn, that is so unfair. Well, first we should discuss how to make coffee. We have to have cold water first because cold water is really the important now, factor. Here. I, I do want to point something out. And I was thinking about this the other day when somebody was bitching about how much coffee is, is consumed in derelict. Um, the first 
series I remember, or, or first book I remember that just had coffee everywhere was The Moat in God's Eye by Pornell and, and uh, oh, yes. David. Yep. Right, because because yep. that's the only time they figure out that the laymill or or whatever the, the it's the laymill, right? Is laymill? It's been so long since I read Moat in God's Eye. Anyway, I whatever the race of aliens, the only way they figure out that they've they've gotten aboard the ship and start fucking with stuff is because all the coffee machines are clean. <laughs> <laughs> and I remember there's yeah. there's like this this uh, Arab. Uh, um, merchant or whatever that's aboard the ship and and he spends like i don't know how many chapters of the book teaching them how to make proper coffee and bitching about the sludge they've been drinking so i just thought that was funny so i'm wondering if nathan lowell grabbed grabbed uh grabbed that from from there or if it was just innate in his being i don't know i suspect from the conversations i've had with nathan and nathan is a brilliant enough author that he made a series of six books with nothing I would call conflict as a military SF writer, at least until book six that I couldn't put down. Uh, I think it's simply just leftovers of his own experience in the merchant <laughs> fleet. <laughs> coffee being what the ships actually run on. Yes. Coffee is what the ships actually run on. Absolutely. And coffee is what the military runs. Well, these days they, they, they may run on Red Bull. I have no idea, but, uh, from what I know of the people I know who are in the military th at this age, they're, they run on coffee still. Hmm. Actually, tea, but that person's intelligence, so. <laughs> Ouch. Damn, I'm not even going to plumb the depths of that particular statement. And how it can be taken. It Canadian be naval intelligence. <laughs> it sound wow, okay, never mind. We're talking about Canucks. Yeah, I oh, yeah. wanted to you that makes total sense. Yeah, make more sense if, she, if they were British, but you know. Eh, 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 I don't know. So how part? How, how big a part does tea play? You know, take in, in how big of a of a part of that culture is in Heart of Vengeance? Is tea I everywhere? Think mentioned, I don't think we mentioned tea once. I think there's a mention of beer. What? And a mention of someone who subsists on starlight instead of beer. But starlight. that's also someone being a snarky bastard. <laughs> okay, I'm lost. That's all right. I never read the book, obviously. <laughs> oh my god! Why were you interested in in bringing this book back? Why were you interested in pulling it back out of the drawer and saying, you know what, this is this is something I I, I want to get out there and I want to yeah. you know continue on, even if I had the to find. With it was it was the it was it, the pieces of it were publishable but the whole wasn't. And I just found that really, really frustrating. So it had niggled at me like a loose tooth for years. Like I knew I could go back and turn this into two novels and take, you know, three months to do it or whatever. And I'd have, and I'd have two publishable novels. I just hate rewriting. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> well, the truth so comes out. So I got Terry to do it. <laughs> Terry, where, where, did you feel like the janitor, you know, just coming in and sweeping up? Is that what was going on here? Maybe a little bit because 19-year-old <laughs> Glenn definitely has a different style of word choice and, and style of writing than modern Glenn. Mm -hmm. Amusingly, 19-year-old Glenn also probably has more politically in common with Terry than I do. <laughs> hmm. Interesting. Not even going to ask. Don't want to know. The, Probably safer that way. When you said yeah. that the 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 the, uh, the the book had a a massive plot problem, is that something you figured out before you uh, how to solve that before you sent it to Terry, or is that something you guys yeah. worked out together? No, I knew what the solution always what the solution had to be, and it was plain and simply that it, there were two novels in there. Okay, and there were several years between those novels. Oh. Uh... Having a three-year time skip in the middle of a book just does not work, especially not if you know something hap anything at all happens in there of an import. So, it, the second half of the book starts with one of the biggest violations of show don't tell I've ever engaged in, and that's a rule I routinely ignore. <laughs> <laughs> so you don't want to put put a big info dump to say here's all the shit that happened between episode one and two. Meanwhile, that in season is one. <laughs> That is basically what the first ch ch first chapter of the second half of the book was. This is everything that happened in the last three years that I don't feel like writing about. 
Oh, you slacker. You slacker. Oh, okay, that brings up an interesting point, though. Mm. Why did you not want to write about that three-year span? Is that because nothing of import happened? Because, well, stuff happened in there. It wasn't stuff that was relevant to the main emotional arc of the book. Okay. Therefore, you didn't feel like there was so any the, point in dragging the characters yeah, through that mess? Like, the book is about the, the main character's revenge. So the first part, part of the book, what became Heart of Vengeance, is him acquiring the resources to actually be able to pursue that revenge or starting on that path. And the second half of the book, what will eventually be Oath of Vengeance, what is him actually getting his revenge? And then there's a time gap in between where he, where you know, he is doing all sorts of things and making a reputation for himself, but he isn't pursuing his revenge. He doesn't have enough information to be able to action it. He also doesn't have enough resources to execute his revenge, so growth exactly. needed to take place to make that happen. Yes. Yeah. So and that growth needed to, to a certain extent that growth is it can happen off screen, but it can't happen off screen in the middle of the book. Okay, fair enough. I see what you're saying. Yeah. Okay. That's and the way that, that we ended up doing this is I took an aspect of the book that existed and I made another set of bad guys out of them. Yep. And I used them as the foil for the remaining half of book one so that we could fill the space and actually still have it mean something because you can't just, you know, write filler. You've got to actually have the story mean something. And it completed the arc that he was going through to transition mm -hmm. from his old life to his new life. And that sets up a place where you can have a gap of a couple of years so that he Agreed. then grows in that new life and he's ready to proceed to tackle the bigger problem. What do you mean you can't write filler? Isn't that basically what all those novels are? It's whether you get to 150,000, 200,000 words is so we can uh, shove all that filler in there to meet, meet some ridiculous word count. I'd rather not do that. <laughs> I could think of very specific examples, but I'm not going to see. I will not speak ill of the greats of the genre at the moment. <laughs> I was going to say bring somebody else up, but uh I would that require me to cough and sneeze and say their name, and I'm not going to do that because this is going to be another James Patterson moment for you. I was not going to go after James Patterson. Well, I really fucking pissed off because Audible sent me this bullshit. Hey, for this extra money, you can get private access to James Patterson's new series. It's like, are you fucking kidding? He didn't even write it. <laughs> are you out of your goddamn minds? My understanding is he writes even less of those than I wrote of Heart of Vengeance. There you go. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Right, here's this plot outline and a title. Go write this thing for me, schmuck. Oh, yeah, by the way, you only get 10% of the proceeds. Fuck you. Um, I have no <laughs> but idea. think of the exposure. Well, think of the exposure. It won't pay the bills, but hey. I don't know. 10% of the proceeds on a Jane Patterson novel is probably a bit more than. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. But that's that's ten percent of the profits after James Patterson pays all of his bills for his trillion dollar house and everything else. You know, he's actually just <laughs> I should have built stuff like that into the contract with Terry. Crap! <laughs> Damn it! Yeah, <laughs> see, opportunities. Glenn, you're just I'm not, not right. following the game plan here, man. Come on, he's I was covering all slave. the expenses. <laughs> I'm covering the expenses for my house out of my half. Damn it! <laughs> he should have so, made the. Should have on there instead of having our names the same size, it should have been Glenn Stewart, <laughs> down at the yeah. bottom. That would have been. That's how James Patterson does it. But yeah, yes. I was trying to be a bit more uh, ethical than that. <laughs> no, you can't have that. No, you can't have ethics in that. So when when you guys were doing this, uh, Terry, when you were working on it, did you go back and ask Glenn specific questions about how you wanted to proceed with certain things? Did you get a plot outline from him? Was how how did that work? This is going to be shocking for anybody that knows me because I don't do outlines. But we went ahead and took the outline that he wrote of what currently existed, and we expanded the first part of it to go ahead and fit in what we thought yeah. should be in there for the next part. And then I proceeded to mostly ignore it as I continued to, to write the end of the book. See, so I both think it's about as close to the outline as anything I ever wrote was to, <laughs> was to my outlines. So we followed the outline about as about, you followed the outline about as well as I expected. <laughs> <laughs> I really wasn't sure when I started this, how, how close I had to adhere. So 
that's why I was glad you were reading it chapter as we went along and, and your continued silence said, okay, I'm, I'm not, I'm not going too far off the reservation here. <laughs> so to, to collaborate on the outline going forward from the original story, is that how so, that worked? He read the original story. I wrote on outline. He sent me his ideas and then I sent him the outline and then we basically bounced the outline back and forth three or four times until we had a final and then we had a final outline, and then Terry took that and the first, I think, 40,000 words of the original Vigilante novel, and that became Heart of Vengeance. So how did that work? Were you guys using, like, Google Docs or something to collaborate on it, or just shipping? It's all on Dro it was all on Dropbox. Okay, so just shipping a doc, or, all right, updating yep. a document between the two of you? Yep. Okay. God, you guys and you can so tell all time. the red ink in the, in the first 14 chapters, there's, there were a lot of word changes that I made because... While I think we write pretty close to the same way of voice, it wasn't as – I was very worried when I started this because I didn't know how differently we were going to be voice-wise. Mm -hmm. But it, it wasn't as bad as I thought it was going to be. It wasn't nearly as, as bad as I was intimidated in the beginning thinking it might be. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think we've ended up with the Vigilante series has a distinct voice that isn't quite mine and isn't quite Terry's. Yeah, that was going to be my next question. So, Terry, when you were writing this, were you trying to ape um, no. his voice? Okay. No, I was not. I When I went through the original language, I tried to clean up the text. I wouldn't say that I tried to bring it into being my language, but the parts mm -hmm. that felt clunky, I changed them. And yep. I didn't worry about trying to ape his style of writing or try to make it more my style of writing. I just tried to make it as smooth and clear as I possibly could. So that mm -hmm. uh, it was what it was. And as we went along, we both changed this text. And so it is something in between the two of us. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm glad that our writing styles are actually fairly close together. Yeah. Is it, Glenn, is that something you actually thought about when you were, uh, when you, when you got his stuff back and uh, started going through it? Is that something that you noticed? Is that something you kind of looked at the, a oh, voice is not really something I consciously consider in okay. my writing. It's something that I go for, does this fit? I do a lot of things where people are like, this is how I have structured this out, and I have a plan for my theme or my voice. And I'm like, yeah, no, theme and voice happen. <laughs> I, just put, I just take out the bits that – I uh, start with a block of, of marble and chip away everything that doesn't look like an elephant. Okay, fair enough. That's my method of getting theme and voice. If it doesn't feel like it fits, it changes. And astonishingly, that's exactly the same thing that I do. What a bunch of slackers. Oh, yes. I, I was expecting some, you know, massive intellectual, you know, no. thesis on how to do this and everything else so our listeners could learn from that. Instead, you're saying go with your gut. That's such a cop out. Yep. Such a massive a cop intellectual out. thesis. Uh, poke me on capitalization of intellectual capital in uh, modern capitalism combined with generally accepted accounting principles. <laughs> that was pure gobbledygook. <laughs> in other words, it, it must have been like a technical paper. That's all I can assume. Uh, I, have a, I have the thesis statement for a PhD in accounting that I could probably turn into a thesis, but I'm not an accountant anymore, so fuck it. Amen. I, 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 I'm with that plan. Go for it. Just keep writing the sci-fi stuff. <laughs> My wife was an accountant before she became disabled. And every time she starts talking accounting, my head hits the desk and I start, you know, I'm glad she doesn't talk like that when I'm driving or I might have an accident falling asleep at the wheel. I understand that happens to people of your age. Oh, whoa. <laughs> <laughs> what did you say? Nothing. Sorry. I couldn't hear you. Uh-huh. Yeah. Bunch of old farts. Uh, hey, 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 hey. <laughs> I've only got a little bit of gray, just just a couple of gray hairs in here. Look at him. He's actually a lot younger than he looks. Oh, damn. <laughs> wow. Wow. Let's just Glenn twisting looks the like, knife, Terry. That's me. Damned with faint praise. Glenn looks like he just graduated from high school and he's on here with a couple old farts. And <laughs> both look like they you know. I'm pretty sure, you know, he's not out of his 20s yet. It's a secret. It's yeah, not. 30s. That's <laughs> bullshit. He's still in his 20s. 19 year old him? Yeah, that was three years ago. Anyway. <laughs> 
Should I be getting off of your lawn, gentlemen? Yes, get off my damn lawn. <laughs> what are you, Paul, in your mid-40s? Yeah, 46. That's what I was saying. I'm just in my early 50s, so yeah, we're, we're, we're a couple of decades further down the path of, of being curmudgeoning. Yeah. Yeah. That's fair. Yeah. I've been told I was a curmudgeon at 25, so go figure. But I got told I was a curmudgeon at 15, so... <laughs> Well, you know, when you start using just for men for your beard, that's that's when you know you've hit it. Obviously, I don't. <laughs> At the point I need to do that, I will more regu I will less regularly have a beard. <laughs> ah, come on! It makes you look stately and and handsome, and that's what I keep telling myself. Mine um, comes in bright Nordic Viking red. Ooh, cool. <laughs> You should keep that. That that's awesome, especially for. I have it about half the year. It's too hot in summer here. Oh, man! Oh, good lord! All right, we need to have him fly down here and spend a summer <laughs> in Houston and see if he. No, don't do stuff. it! Don't do it! No, <laughs> I refuse. You'll never break about the heat that you deal with again, buddy. <laughs> ever, <laughs> ever. Stop it's the humidity whining. that gets you. Yeah, it's the humidity that kills you. Mexico in uh, March was hot enough for me forever. Thanks. Oh, at least that's a dry heat. I was on the coast. It was not a dry heat. Oh, well, yeah, but then you got the ocean. True. Which you could actually swim in as opposed to the shithole that we call Galveston. <laughs> <laughs> that's an entirely different thing. Sorry. You're, we're, you're getting, getting off reasons. on the side there, sport. Yeah. <laughs> wow, we've drifted off topic. I'm shocked. Indeed. Hor horrified, traumatized, completely surprised. Or, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. So this book is, uh, you just said it's going to be a two book series. Is that plan the plan right now? Plan is a duology. Um, Terry is making mouthings about a book three. And I am, might decide to do something. We'll see. Depends on how they do economically and what we can, what kind of agreement we can come to. Indeed. When I ran the report this morning, we'd made $12. I also read that report approximately 30 minutes after the booklet launched. So. Yeah, I'm looking at the best selling rank and it's a 4,098 in the Kindle store. So I have a feeling it's going to do very well when it's made more than $12. It's only a 4,000? Huh. Pipe. Yeah. You just published it, you schmuck. It's a new <laughs> series. It just published. It's probably not going it, to. If it's anything like when I launch a new series, it's not going to do nearly as well as the established series do. That's just the way it works. We'll see. Uh, it has, it'll hit my mailing list in the morning, and then we'll, that'll be the probably the bigger boost it'll get. And then it'll trickle down for three days, and then the algorithms will kick in, and it'll boost bump back up, as they always do. Yeah, it'll hit my mailing list as well. I still haven't written the, the, the email for it, so it'll go out tonight. Yeah. So are you going to I'm hoping also... for top I'm hoping for you know number one on Amazon here. I have high expectations of your work, Terry. <laughs> if only we'll see. I hope so too. But I'm not gonna count on this. <laughs> so right right now this book's only available in Kindle. Are you planning yep. a TPB? Uh, paperback will be going will probably be uploaded and so forth tonight. I'm just waiting on finalizing the, the wraparound. We just need to plug in. I need my wife to plug in the actual number of pages into that into that and spit out a PDF for me. Gotcha. And she's distracted by the kitten, <laughs> as as all three of us are um, distracted by kittens. He's also a vellum user, so mm -hmm. you know, I'm obviously the one that's far behind the power curve here. I I'm not actually that big a fan of vellum's paperbacks, but they work. I haven't tried it yet, so we're probably going to try um, it on It's the next amazingly slick. It's super efficient. It's incredibly easy to use. I can just produce a better product in InDesign. It just it takes me four hours to do it in InDesign, and it takes me five minutes to do it in Vellum. Wow. And I haven't decided whether that balance is worth it yet. How many paperbacks do you sell? Um, between two and 400 a month, depending on... Hmm. So usually two, three hundred a month and then a three, four hundred in a launch month. Wow. 
That's impressive. That's across 18 novels. So I'm only really selling like 10, 15 of each novel sort of thing. Uh, you know what? It doesn't matter. That's 10 to 15 of, of each novel. Therefore, you're getting three to 400 sales a, at a pop. Yep. And you're using CreateSpace for those? Yep. Okay. So then yep. you're, you're, you're getting all that money pretty much sans printing costs. Uh, yeah, I mean, I get about the same for a paperback that sells on, on Amazon, at least as I get for an ebook that sells on Amazon. Okay. Interesting. Are you also thinking about doing an audio book for this one? We're thinking about it. I don't, I have, don't think there's really been a decision yet. Audible just, ACX just opened up for Canadian publishers recently. That's right. Yeah. I forgot about that. So we'll pro my inclination is to use Heart as a testing ground for Phelan's Pen's a ACX account, but I haven't even opened it yet. And I don't like listening to audiobooks, so it'll require me to dump proof again on Terry, which he's already volunteered for because he's a sucker. Ouch. Terry. I just heard that I volunteered for it. No, no, you just heard you were volunteered for <laughs> oh, it. That it? <laughs> That's Actually, a completely different deal. <laughs> when this first came up, I asked, and he said, sure, I can do that. I probably uh, did. Uh, yeah, he was, <laughs> I don't remember. He's, he's probably willing to agree to anything. He was on his meds that day. <laughs> oh, <laughs> I know that uh, when, you, when we first posted word about this, that um, a couple of people that do audiobooks had immediately said, ooh, ooh. Oh, I'm interested. And yeah, so one of my there's... one of my narrators and your narrator were about to have a cat fight in the comments. I'm, I'm, I want to keep all the blood inside my body, so I'm going to step right <laughs> back and say that's the publisher's. <laughs> <laughs> Once again, Terry, Terry just handles conflict by copping out. <laughs> so that I guess that means I can. I'm not sure. What, or, um, so should I be doing it? Handling that myself or outsourcing it to my business partner and handles operations. <laughs> yeah. How does that feel to basically, uh, you, you, you're obviously, if you're, you're doing all this stuff, Andy, you've also been you know, the, the, the publisher, you're dealing with editors, you're dealing with cover designers, I assume. I don't know that for sure. Yeah. I have, my wife is also my business partner. And I think is actually technically going to be the, as we break down titles at the end of the year, I believe we're actually moving her to, to be the CEO of the company. And I will be hovering off on the side as chief operating officer, probably, in terms of titles. Because she actually does more to run Phelan's Pen, the actual publishing business, than I do. Okay. I write the books, which are, you know, what where Phelan's Pen's business comes from. But she does all of the contracting. The only per people she doesn't deal with is the copy editor. Wow. Okay. So she, she deals with the with, cover designer? She does all the – she did. She used to do the covers herself, and then her health no longer allowed that. So now she coordinates with all the cover designers. She speaks the language of visual design in a way I don't. So when we filter my, my concepts through her, we get far better creative briefs to go out to the artist – and I find that even some of the best artists in the business do much better work when you're challenging them to do something different. Tom Edwards is amazing, but the covers I get from him are better than the covers he does for a lot of people. <laughs> is that because you raise the expectations? I think it's because uh, we raise the expectations. We, tell, we give him a clearer idea of what we want, and we challenge him to do something a bit beyond the usual have this, the, the – Bog standard t uh, Tom Edwards spaceship on F next to a planet, <laughs> which has become a stereotype at this point. Hey, hey, hey! Stop describing the the, the cover for Derelict. All right, just just quit <laughs> that right now. Stop describing the der the Derelict Marine. I believe I just described the covers of half of the top 100 for space opera for the last year. Yeah, I think you and yeah. probably for the last 20 years or 50 years or since well, they were the last invented. year. They've been, half of them have been Tom Edwards specifically. <laughs> Ah, so he he's like the go-to person for space opera now. Is that he has been the go-to person for space opera for a while? And I think Chris Fox complains about it because Chris Fox was the guy who was like, "Yeah, and I hired Tom Edwards for this," and then Tom Edwards now books six months out. So. Oh, uh, hmm, yeah. Time to find somebody whose deadlines match up with yours a little bit better. I booked Tom Edwards. I am booked with for my covers for everybody through next year. The end wow. Of next year. wow so how many hours a day do you write 
So, uh, depends on the day. I aim for 5,000 words a day. Usually that's about an eight hour work day, about half of which is actually writing. So I'll write for half an hour and do something else for half an hour and then back and forth through the day. Okay. So you break it up. You don't, you don't try and do yeah. it all in one step. God, no, I can't. <laughs> Why not you slacker? Cause we'd go nuts. Oh, come on. I know Terry sits there for 10 hours and stares at the screen and just sits there and pecks at his keyboard the entire mm -hmm. time. Doesn't do anything else. No. I write for 30 minutes, and then I go play Overwatch, and then I write for 30 minutes, and then I go play Overwatch. <laughs> <laughs> wow, I need to try that. I'll write, write for 30 minutes, go play, get my ass kicked in Siege, come back and write another 30 minutes. That's what I need to be doing, apparently. Yeah, then you'll just be more bitter. <laughs> got my ass kicked. I'm going to be bitter. No, I'll look forward to writing. Oh, good. Something I could do. <laughs> 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 Something a man of my, my age could actually be good at. That's the way that needs to work. That's interesting. So you work throughout the entire day, but basically you're taking you're taking longer than than like you know little coffee breaks. You're 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 actually yeah. going out and doing something else. Yeah, it's I say Overwatch because that's what I'm playing right now, but it's, it's often video games. Like I do a lot of half hour writing, half hour video games, half hour writing. Interesting. Basically, okay. the way I'll end up doing is that I'll write a scene, I'll go do something else. I'll come back and I'll read that scene that I just wrote and then I'll write another scene and I try to aim for three scenes a day and I actually write seven days a week as opposed to five days a week. So I, I end up with about 3,500 finished words a day, but it's, it's probably close to the same output a week that, that Glenn has. Yeah. I aim for 5,000 words a day, five days a week, and I end up somewhere between 20 and 25,000 words a week. Yep. I'm a slacker. I'm a slacker. Of course, I'm being I'm being insane with my goals for 2018. I'm actually going to try to make a novel a month. Yeah, uh, my comparison. We'll see how well that works. Is, uh, <laughs> my comparison point is a young lady named Amanda Lee who works uh, who writes in paranormal romance and urban fantasy and cozy mysteries, who consistently turns out seventy thousand words a week. Yikes! I cannot even imagine that. That's a lull. She will day. release, I believe, fifty six novels in 2017. Dang! I think that's, no. sorry. I think that's fifty-six novels, novellas, and short stories. Oh my god! <laughs> no. <laughs> that's no. Number two names. Yeah. No, that's, I, that's like a quarter I, of a million words. When I grow words, up, I want to be Mendeley. What, Glenn? When I grow up, I want to be a Mendeley. <laughs> See, I, I don't think I could write the books I want to write that fast. I just don't think I could do it. Um. I think this 5, last year, words a day is a, a really good balance for me. I think this last year, if I look, I bet I'll have published six novels by the time I'm done with 2017, six or seven novels. And mm -hmm. so it's taken, I've been writing full time for two years now and I'm having to work myself up into higher performance every yep. year. So I'm finally okay. getting to where I feel like I can accomplish more every day and get into the groove all the time. So I'm, I'm finally hitting my stride. Yeah, and I'm, I've been doing this full time for about the same amount of time. And that's what I'm feeling as well. I wrote 100,000 words in July. And that's not something I plan on doing every month. But I definitely feel that I'm hitting my stride. And this is not only what at the pace I was aiming for, but a pace I can sustain, which I wasn't actually expecting it to be. I was only really aiming to keep up eight books a year for a couple of years and then slow things down as, you know, I get old and decrepit. <laughs> Hold it! <to laughs> Fuck you! <laughs> oh damn these kids! <laughs> so before you before you were uh, going before you went full time, how many how many uh, words a day or words a week or you know words a month were you, were you on average getting? I was targeting about a thousand words a day as best I could, like five hundred to a thousand words a day. So. And how often were you hitting that? Usually, I mean, the year in twenty fifteen before I went full time. I released three novels, I think, okay. and between January and September of 2017, of 2015, I released three novels, and then I went full time and released a fourth in December. Writing, writing as fast as you do now, do you feel like uh, the complexity of the stories suffers at all, or does, is it just about the same as it was before? 
it depends it's all on the outline i find that's the only way i can write the speed i write is because i work out a lot of the complexity in advance and by doing that i keep i think i'm pretty sure i still have just as complex just as intertwined stories as i always had okay like the the new duchy of terror book that's coming out at the end of the month i think is one of the best novels i've ever written i am so glad to hear that i'm looking forward to that sucker <laughs> <laughs> Jeez, I'm I'm shocked that Terry would look forward to a Glenn Stewart novel. I am so shocked. I've only been raving about you for what a year and something since I since I wrote the first novel. <laughs> yeah, I've had to hear all about. I'm sick of hearing your name, buddy. <laughs> sick of hearing your name. And you never even met me before today, and you're already sick of my name. Wow. That's right. I've had enough of your shit already. It's that's the way that works. It's all Terry's fault. I can accept that. Started- when I started writing the last half of Heart of Vengeance, I had some vague ideas that already varied from where the plot line was going to go, characters that were going to make an appearance, and I'm, I'm actually surprised by how well it all came together at the end where I tied everything sort of together and left a few plot threads lurking out there. Yep. But that's, that's pretty I'm waiting much for the shipping wars to come out of this book. Waiting for the what? The shipping wars. The people who are shipping Brad and Falcon. Because it's going to happen. I actually thought about that a little bit. So, I yeah. <laughs> the There's the sequence in there where I'm like, yeah, and the guy looks at them and, go, and classes them as, as a fair and moves on. It's like, yep. <laughs> there were definite moments of, are these two three wrong words away from tearing each other's clothes off? <laughs> or is this just not that kind of book? <laughs> It wasn't that kind of book, no. Why? <laughs> why? Terry used to write erotica. It's true. Well, why aren't there any erotic? Well, I guess there probably are. Why aren't you guys writing erotic space opera? What's wrong with you? Because Lindsay Baroker does it so much better than we can. It's true. <laughs> it's totally true. Bullshit. Poor planning. You're just giving up, copping out. Have you okay. read her Ryan Strike stuff? <laughs> no. <laughs> Is that, but that is an interesting question for you. you. You've been writing military sci-fi and space opera and obviously some fantasy. Is there anything else in the science fiction realm that you kind of want to go after? Is there something on your bucket list? Is there something you want to try? Mostly it's my brain is bubbling over with different ideas for space opera. Some of them a bit more deeper and more thematic more literary, I suppose, for all there will still be explosions. <laughs> and that's probably what's going to be my, ver- my first big step out of my current comfort zone, so to speak, is what I'm currently calling Secret Project E, which is kind of intended to be my massive science fiction magna- magnum opus. Mm. You're, you're how old and you're writing a magnum opus? Meh, it probably will still be shorter than a David Weber novel. Oh, God. <laughs> Well, even beyond that, you know, there's Brandon Sanderson. You, you're not going to hit that level, so you're all right. I thought no. we, I thought we had you're decided gone. that he had become he who shall not be named on this show, or was that James <laughs> Patterson? I remember which. <laughs> Just don't have as many meetings as David Weber does. <laughs> I've never read a David, a David yeah. Weber book, but my understanding is three quarters of it now is his meetings. Sixty <laughs> percent. Feels like it sometimes, yeah. The problem is that David Weber writes a really fascinating personal interaction meeting. That's you don't really real. You hit the end of the book and you look back and you're like, "That was sixty percent meetings. I couldn't put it down." But this doesn't make any sense. (laughs) (laughs) Like writing a hundred thousand words about coffee. Eh. Yeah, coffee on a spaceship. Coffee on well, of course, coffee on a spaceship. I mean, you can't have it any other way, right? That's the only way to make sure it's vacuum fresh. Exactly. Yes. Answering the same question grown? he did. The, um, <laughs> God, I didn't get a I groan. I want to come back. I, I'm I want very to get back to now. <laughs> I'm very depressed. I didn't get a groan over that pun. You guys suck. Eh, we're used to it from you. We just ignored yeah. it. I have friends who are pun masters, and I just tune out puns automatically at this point. I have Terry. I try and tune him out, but uh, it's not working so far. It makes the show very weird if you're not talking to the co-host. 
I don't like to think of him as a co-host. I like to think of him as more of a digital growth. A blight on his life, perhaps. <laughs> a blight on my life. <laughs> Yeah, why do we do this show every week? I I, I still understand. I, I suspect it's because you're a masochist. Ah, oh, no, maybe he, you're right. We're science fiction authors. I thought masochism was par for the course. <laughs> well, I'm not just a science fiction author. I'm also a horror writer. So, um, yeah. Oh yeah, masochist. <laughs> yeah, and and also sadist. Mm. I enjoy torturing my characters. I think it's self-loathing, really. Oh, there's there's tons. Of, I thought I thought writing brought out self-loathing. I thought that was that was part of the deal. Certainly brings out insecurities and uncertainties. <laughs> yeah, yes. another shit that you know is kind of terrifying. One of the biggest things that I learned just starting this out is that that's helped me so much is that I have no idea how good anything I write is. I have to let other people tell me if it's any good or not. So I don't I, I don't go yeah. crazy thinking about it. Yeah, I have stopped to a certain extent. I try very hard not to pay attention to my own opinion of my work when I finish it. <laughs> I, it's just I, it's done. It gets edited. It goes out, and I try not to think about it in between. I usually get scared when I go through my second pass, and and if I'm enjoying the book, I'm like, "What's wrong with it? <laughs> oh, <laughs> What's yeah. wrong with it? Oh yeah, something's got to be wrong." I'm a couple something. that I, I terrified me until I actually sat down and did the second pass. I'm like, "Okay, this is actually kind of good." <laughs> <laughs> it meets expectations. <laughs> Whatever ceases to amaze me is when I, I publish one, I'm like, oh gosh, I still don't know about this, how this is going to work. I publish it. And then the readers come back and tell me what they liked about it and what I was doing. I'm like, I don't remember doing any of this. Are you sure you're reading the same book? <laughs> That's okay. That's, uh, hey, I always get reviews telling me that it's Lesbians Gone Wild in Space. So. Lesbians gone it's because wild. Because your books space. are so filled with lesbians. Yes, apparently. Uh, uh, yep. Uh, or the one that was complaining about Terran Five Tear just being kissy face boys. Oh. What? <laughs> oh, my reviews are entertaining. Oh, so are ours. So are I don't read ours. my reviews. I have no idea. They're probably very entertaining, but I don't. Oh, know. I occasionally jump on there to see if it, what 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 crazy thing. I, I I only go look at the one and two star reviews. If you ever want a, a laugh at just how what uh, just what people think they can say on the internet in this era, and just wow, go read the one and two star reviews on Space Carrier Avalon. Mm. Mm -mm -mm. I, I know one of the yes. authors on the secret group that that, that uh, we're all three of us are part of. I think um, the uh, somebody said that their one of their books got a review, and it was really a review for a toaster they'd ordered from Amazon, and it was. <laughs> On there a few reviews where I have read the review and I'm like, I seriously don't know what book you're talking about, <laughs> but it's not mine. I got a, I got a contact off of my website, somebody saying that they had loved my work up to this point, but they could not possibly continue after the last book that I published that was just filled with filthy language and all kinds of other things. And I said, are you sure you're talking about this book? because I'm pretty confident that it doesn't have any bad language in it. And the answer back was, never mind. <laughs> it was probably a review for one of my books is how that worked. <laughs> no, I get the email saying that you're, you're, such, you're far too good an author to use this level of profanity in your work, and you should you know, be more realistic with it or something. I don't remember anymore. I just started tuning them all out. <laughs> Yeah, those are the people that have never met anybody who is in the military while they were in the military and knows nothing about the military. Uh, my The officers in my book swear like accountants. <laughs> I suspect they don't swear enough to be actual military officers, but they swear at about the level you'll hear in a meeting of the senior accountants at most mid-sized companies. Yeah, my officers swear like the enlisted, and the enlisted swear like, well... Yeah. Sailors? <laughs> uh, enlisted sailors from the 1890s. <laughs> Talking about things that, that we would like to write, I've, I've written one post-apocalyptic novel. I'd like to write more in that, so I'll have to My come My parents back to that. adored your post-apocalyptic novel, I should tell you. Oh, I'm, I'm glad to hear that because... Yeah, the, the, see, this, this <laughs> just goes back and confirms what I've always known. Only old people read Terry's books. It could be true. <laughs> 
I definitely have a I fan base. Books too. I definitely have a fan base of, of older readers. So this this could be true. So do I. <laughs> I. Every time I send out a mailing list email, I get a note. I get you know the bunch of unsubscribes back, and at least one of them seems to, these days seems to be labeled "passed away." <laughs> oh no! Oh god! I feel like I might outlive my audience. <laughs> oh, that's horrible! Oh my god! I've never gotten one of those. Ooh. I want to write an urban I'll fantasy novel now. as well, but I just. I have an idea and I have not found the time in my schedule that I can afford to do it. <laughs> like I need another my schedule series. was booked up through the end of next year for writing. And I'm kind of grumpy because I keep getting new plot bunnies. Plot bunnies. Yes. Like dust bunnies only. Yeah. I know how that works. Yeah. It, and if you spend in the any... back of my brain where the plot bunnies breed and they don't go and away. You, and if you spend any time with Terry, he'll be more than happy to stuff more of them in there every five minutes. True. <laughs> it's, it's I just, love brainstorming. I don't, I don't need any help. Yeah, mine do not need any help. No, nobody really needs help with those. Terry just, you know, cackles with laughter when he sees the look on other people's faces when he gives them an idea. I do. I, I have. Just friend, I have a, it's a couple of really successful romance authors of my acquaintance who are like, "Yep, every time I finish a book, it's a six-week period of stress or trying to come up with the idea for the next one." What? And they're always worried that they're never going to have another, that they're not going to have another idea. Wow. They should look at my story. Oh, shit. Wow. I, I can't, I, I mean, can't this fathom is, having that problem. And this is a lady who is extremely successful. But every time she finishes a book, it is a massive fit issue for her to come up with the idea for the next one. I was, I'm, I'm going through the list of making a story Bible for my Empire of Bones saga. And I've gotten I should do that. the first four books done. I've, I'm a little bit behind because I've got a few sheets of paper of the ones from the last three books that I need to enter into that to, to bring it up to current. And I keep at the bottom, I have open plot threads, just things that I've said or done that could be approached in another book. And it's huge and it's not getting any smaller. <laughs> I am seriously tempted to find somebody I can pay to go through my books and build me a wiki of every na of every character and ship in, in them all. If you find someone that does that, let me know because I might be right behind you. <laughs> Strangely <laughs> enough, we've had that conversation very recently on this show. It's true. <laughs> Terrifyingly, I actually have people I could pay to do that. I just don't want to know what they charge me. Yeah, we, we both have that problem too. Uh, Terry, Terry just says, you know, you gotta you gotta grab minions and run with them. So, I have minions. I've just thought, haven't decided whether or not this is something I want to pay my minions to handle. Right, and yeah, but we're 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 in the same boat. <laughs> both of us. I have, we are not in the same. Boat. He has a publicist. We do not. Well, we we don't rate publicists. You probably I'm do it. I rate point. a pub. I have a publicist. So I guess I rate a publicist. I don't know anymore. Um, I'm looking at your, you know, uh, your your charts here. You you rate a publicist. <laughs> Terry's close to rating Did a publicist. Take, I'm at the moment, the point where I still have to occasionally stop and you know remind myself that I am generally in the top 100 authors in Kindle Unlimited every month, and should probably start to consider myself as potentially one of the bigger science fiction authors alive. And my brain just refuses to compute that and sort of self-destructs every time we have this conversation. Mm-hmm. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. We're not really wired for our own success. We aren't, no. No. Uh, I have, you know, 500 five-star reviews, great. One one-star review, sobbing in the bathroom. <laughs> <laughs> There's a reason I don't read this reviews. <laughs> I have minions who will tell me about uh, occasionally tell me about a really really bad review that they read, um, and they'll they'll boil it down to the humorous aspects of it. But uh, yeah, I need that. I I am I have been repeatedly encouraged by my soon to be CEO to do that, and I just haven't gotten around to it yet. You know, yeah, I, looking at, at the the urban fantasy story that I wanted to write, I fully intend to have a character in there track down some reviewers from something on Amazon and kill them. And that's going to be the bad guy that they have to deal with in this is, is some guy that's tracking down bad reviewers and killing them. So it sounds like a book I would write. Why aren't you writing it? 
Because I got all this other shit to write. I got Just monsters eating people. Schedule. Come on. I got monsters. People love my monsters. As long as I have monsters eating people, I'll be selling books. That's well, how then why works. don't you have somebody investigating the monster that's killing people that leave bad reviews on Amazon? Because I have other <laughs> monsters doing other shit right now. God. Get in line, bitches. <laughs> the line is recorded there is a publishing schedule and I still bug about the fact that I have my writing time scheduled for the next 18 months oh my god I can't schedule anything as far as writing time beyond individual days I say I'm going to try to write my 3500 words today most days I make it some days I don't and I just leave a little play in there for the fact that I'm going to have some days that I don't hit it and stumble towards my goals of getting novels published <laughs> Yeah. I have a specific sequence that novels will be released in. I have to book my editor uh, about three months in advance. So, and my artists are, I think like everyone I'm using for artists at this point, I swear half of them have to book six months to a year in advance. So everything is scheduled out. I know what I'll be writing through the end of next year. Mm. There's one thing, if depending on how the urban fantasy series goes, that may actually end up getting axed out of my schedule, which will give me some more flexibility, but I will be quite sad if that happens. Interesting. Thus far, my wife does my covers. She uses stock art, and it's worked well enough so far, so I'm glad I don't have to try to, to schedule artists into it. I'd go insane. I have my wife schedule the artists into it. It works great. <laughs> I see how this works. There's a reason that she's the CEO, and I'm not. I make her. She does all the stuff that isn't writing at this point. Uh -huh. It's a really effective division of labor, actually. Yeah, I, I wish I could let go of more things. If you if you've got a partner that's uh, that's you know handling all those aspects, so you can focus on the stuff that you're supposed to be doing, that that's yep. that's got to be wonderful. It is amazing. She is the only reason I'm in this business. Well, good to know. So there you go, dearest listeners. Find somebody <laughs> else that you can hand all this uh, all this shit off to, and you'll be a happier person for it. Well, she's also the one who told me to try this. So she is the only re if I did not have if I had not married my wife, I would not be a self-published author. That's terrifying. Yeah. She is the only reason this ever happened. Huh. Interesting. Well, do you have any words of wisdom to give our writing audience before we wrap this up? Uh, words of wisdom? I don't have any wisdom. Well, there you have it, wisdom. folks. <laughs> 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 all right my only advice to people is just, is just keep writing that's nine tenths of it all right like that's that's all the stuff around you know this scam or that scam or this advertising program or that advertising program just keep writing books the best thing you can do to to sell books is write is put up another book yeah, and I think we, we forget f that a lot with everything that goes on in this business. We do forget, and we keep telling ourselves. And even though we're the ones saying it, we still forget it. It's true. Oh yes. So yep. it, it's it's it, it it's it's good to hear that from from somebody else and have them also say, "Oh yes, we forget this all the time." Because I know Terry <laughs> and I do. Yeah, and I, I'm pretty damn sure every author we've ever had on this show has the same problem to a certain <laughs> extent. <laughs> yeah. We all we all struggle with our insecurities, and we all forget that now. The best thing you can do is write the next damn book. Well, cool. Well, Glenn, thank you very much for coming on. Glenn and Terry's book, Heart of Vengeance, Vigilante Book One, just came out. So uh, you all should go check it out, and also go look at uh, the show notes for Glenn Stewart's author page. Terry's author page is always there, so you can ignore him. You probably looked at it before, but. Uh, so check out Glenn Stewart and go through the archives and and read our review of uh, the Terran Privateer. If you want to get an idea of what's going on with this Glenn guy. So that said, if you have complaints, comments, accolades, whatever else, death threats. Bitter denunciations. Bitter denunciations. You can send them to show at deadrobotsociety.com. You can tweet me at Paul underscore E underscore Cooley. Or you can join our Facebook group, the listeners of the Dev Robot Society, where you will find a massive conglomeration of crazy people who post things daily, uh, ask questions, find beta readers, argue about certain things. We, we love our community. It's growing every day. It's been awesome to watch it grow and, and uh, also contribute to it. It's been, been a wonderful experience. 
And we'd be remiss if we didn't thank our wonderful host, Bot Hoster, for making all 14 trillion episodes of Dev Robot Society available for your ear holes. That said, if you want to help us keep the show on the air and commercial free, you can become a Patreon patron for as little as $1 a month. Get access to early podcast episodes, live shows, um, ask questions of the two doofuses that are currently hosting this mess, and uh, um, receive other entitlements, like if the $10 level, you get your name called out every week. And you also get the opportunity to make Paul say really stupid shit. And since we're talking about stupid shit, here we go. Our $10 patrons as of this second are Drew Bernardi, Robert Slade, John Kilgallen, Chris Winder, Isabel Cushy, Andre Conde Moraes, DJ Chamberlain, Jonathan Zarusen, J.R. Hanley. I just love saying it like that. J.R. Hanley, Caleb, what the hell happened to Meg Ryan's face, James? Why? Caleb, why? And Sue, my editor is Sue Bayman, which actually is a real comment because uh, that is my editor. So uh, go to patreon.com slash DRS podcast for more information on that. Like I said, check the show notes for links to Glenn's site, Glenn's author page, and et cetera, as well as Terry. Well, you and, should uh, actually, I'm going to stop you here. You should let him go ahead and say for himself oh, yes. where we can find him. You know, I can't believe I forgot to say that. Glenn, where the hell can we find you? Amazon. <laughs> also, uh, www.glennstuart.com. Which then... That'll redirect. Right now, that's a redirect, but relatively quickly, that'll actually be my full website. Okay. Fair enough. Terry, see, so you completely do. And I'm on Facebook. That. I have an author page as just Glenn Stewart author. Ooh, okay. Well, more things that I'll have to get in the editing. All right. Any last words, Mr. Mixon? Keep writing. Keep writing. I think we can go with that. Also, uh, one last thing, because Terry derailed me, you can also find our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash DRS podcast, where you can see all the madness, you know, for your, if you want to see what we look like, you might probably want to see what our guests look like us. Not so much. Anyway, you can go up there and see that, uh, leave comment, review, subscribe, and, and, uh, uh we'll get you there. With that said, uh, we'll cut it off for this week and, uh, we'll be back next week with more crazy. Thank you very much for coming on, Glenn. It was a blast. Thank you for having me. You're very welcome. Terry, I'll see you next week. Bye-bye. There. See. Have fun, you... children. <laughs> when you say something, the picture changes, so you should say something. Bye, folks. <laughs>